So often with substance use disorders, we find that there's an underlying contributing factor, whether it's depression, trauma, or anxiety. So when we see these underlying factors and they're not addressed, they can spiral and become even bigger issues. But remember, that doesn't mean that a client can't turn their situation around. I'm Clint Malley, and this is Real Common Treatable, where we help behavioral health professionals stay at the forefront of adolescent mental health, addiction, and substance use treatment. In this episode, we're going to talk about co-occurring disorders, and more specifically, high-functioning depression paired with substance use, and the steps that you can use with a client to help someone rewrite their story. Our teacher today is Kellen Fluckinger. He is a keynote speaker, motivator, and author, and who has personally struggled with depression and substance use. That was until 14 years ago when he changed his mindset and ultimately his life. We are going to hear about his 35 year struggle with depression and substance use, his five steps to a new mindset, and two bonus tips that someone can use to change their situation. His goal now is to help 10 million people to discover, develop, and then learn to serve others. So let's jump right in. So my origin story is interesting, uh, probably not dissimilar. I was born in a two-parent family, San Francisco Bay Area, raised sort of middle-class-ish. The kicker was that my mom was pretty young when she got married, and she had the idea that there was only a certain way to behave, connected to religion and being good and that sort of thing. And the discipline used in our family was would-be felony child abuse today. So I got the crap beat out of me a lot. What it left me with when I finally left home at 17 was the conviction that I wasn't good enough. And no matter what happened, I wouldn't be. I also believed to the core of my soul that it was all my fault and that I needed to you know, suck it up and be better. And if I just had my crap together, I'd be okay. So. When I left home, rather than discarding all that, I never talked to anyone about the feelings I had. I believed that I needed to get that validation, particularly from my mom and externally. And so for the next 35 years, from 17 to 52, I lived a roller coaster of making a lot of money because I thought that made me cool, having miserable relationships, and periods of addiction and rehab and all that sort of stuff behind the scenes. And all that time was a very high functioning addict and depressive. I never talked to anyone about what was going on in my life and what I felt, but I would continually self-sabotage. I don't deserve this success, so I would crash it, either the relationship or the career things, and then I would create it again and and crash it again and create it again. I worked for a governor in California whose chief of staff yanked me in her office one day and was ripping my head off for different things that were going on because they were afraid my scandals were going to bring down the administration, that level of stuff. And so for 35 years, that was life until at in 2007, which was when I was 52, I was at the pinnacle of that. I was making enough money that my $3,000 a week cocaine addiction didn't matter. And so I ended up being married and divorced three times. And I had four teenage kids, four of my 10 kids were living with me as a single dad. Uh, three of them were grown up and married and three of them were with, it's embarrassing to say this, but one of my exes and that was a person that I was at the it just continually riding this roller coaster of success, self sabotage, and failure. It was bad enough that I remember saying to myself, I don't know who I am. I can put on the three piece Armani and I can go downtown and do battle and do whatever I need to do. When the lights go out and I'm alone, I have no clue who I am. This life story really shows the importance of a support system, the feeling of not being good enough, and how it can be a serious limiter. So don't be afraid to reach out for help when you need it. Before the, the divine intervention, uh, in August of 2007, I came home from work one day and um, 
I was going to go out party for the weekend on a Friday night. <clears throat> that would have been like till Monday or Tuesday. And suddenly before I went out, I've had this urge to turn on the television. Now that doesn't sound like anything except I didn't watch TV, but I realized I don't know how to turn this on. So I had one of my daughters come in and she turned it on through the remote at me. So it landed on a program I'd never heard of. And the program's titled Intervention. <clears throat> now that's a reality TV show about families who stage interventions for busted loved ones. And I'd never seen it, never heard of it, but the uh, protagonist was a high ranking executive with a cocaine problem. So I watched about 10 minutes of myself on the screen. I'm like, yeah, screw this. So I turned it off. I'm not watching this crap. And I did the, some dishes and a couple other things. I was going to go out the door and I felt compelled to turn the TV back on. So I turned the TV on and that program, and it's 20 or 30 minutes later, started over. And no, I don't have a DVR. And no, it wasn't on the schedule. And no, it can't do that. But it did and it scared the crap out of me. So I'm like, okay. I guess I'm supposed to watch this. So I watched it and it went poorly. The guy refused all help, yelled at his family, stomped out and so forth. But it scared me bad enough that I didn't go out. I went to bed. Who are you going to call? Ghostbusters. But seriously, I wouldn't be able to go to sleep. When I went to bed, I went to hell. And what I mean by that is I went somewhere. It felt out of body, but I was in a place that looked like a theater, felt like theater. And across the stage was uh, incidents of my life, not fast, slow, focusing on the suffering, both that had been inflicted on me as a kid, all the way up through all the suffering I had inflicted on others as an addict and a ruiner of relationships and all that stuff. And the intensity of that suffering, I cannot describe, but it went on for an interminable period. And then a voice said softly, it is enough. I woke up. And the sun was shining in the window, which was weird because the windows faced west. So I got up and I realized that it was five o'clock Saturday afternoon. So I'd been somewhere for almost 18 hours. I got up and I realized that I'd been invited to change. I had no idea what to do. I had no idea where to start, but I knew for sure that what I was an outside catalyst like this can be a powerful motivator. Sometimes that catalyst comes from within while receiving professional support, but whenever that influence comes from or wherever it comes from, whatever point of the journey that you're in, it's never too late to turn your situation around. D4 was done. Threw away a thousand dollars worth of stuff that I had laying around because I always did and quit cold turkey straight up right now one day to the next to zero that was the first part of the intervention the second shoe fell two weeks later that got me sober but it didn't do anything to deal with the depression and self-loathing that was the real problem the drugs and everything else were just handy but they weren't the real problem two weeks later uh, i hadn't quit even though i knew i had to get away out of the whole industry, just start over. But I didn't know what to do. In the positions I had, I used to get all kinds of free stuff. Uh, so one of the things I got was a free pair of tickets. Yeah, I thought it would be a terrible shame to waste this other ticket because I was single again. So I asked in the groups that I managed, who likes classical music? Some lady in one of the groups said, well, I do. I said, okay, fine, see you there. I gave her the ticket and we met at the venue and the concert was amazing. And halfway through, now you gotta remember, I'm two weeks stone cold sober at this point. Halfway through the show, I felt this feeling that I recognized from two weeks before and this voice in my head said, <clears throat> you need to marry this woman. And I said, you're insane. And that's just not happening. Later that night, the feeling came back, said, comma, and you need to tell her tonight. And I said, what? No, not happening. She got me arrested for harassment. It's not happening. And you don't win those arguments. So I did. And it went about you would have imagined, are you insane? What are you thinking? But she didn't have me arrested. So within two weeks, she had her own set of experiences. And she resigned from her very nice career. I walked away from millions of dollars of contracts. And we walked off into the sunset, more or less. And two and a half months ago, we celebrated our 14th wedding anniversary. And her name is Joy. Like, you can't make this stuff up.
Now, you may be wondering, why are you telling me this story? Okay, rude, first of all, but you're gonna wanna hear what comes next. And so, the reason that this story matters isn't the story. The reason it matters is because the first piece got me sober. The second piece was literally an angel that was sent to help me deal with decades of silence, isolation, and depression. She was invincible in her support. I was 52 before I finally figured out I had to change. It's never too late. It's never, it's too, you can't do this. It, there is always an invitation. And maybe I was so thick I needed a two by four. Okay, but all of us have felt these inclinations, these invitations, these yearnings, these feelings to do something different, something more. And it took me all those years to finally say yes. So from that time, the last 14 years, she taught me how to be a person, how to be a friend, how to have a friend, how to tell the truth. I've been a liar all my life. I had to learn that when I was a kid to protect myself. And I just invented my reality as I went along and got really good at it. All the things that you need to learn to have and to be a person who's successful, who's authentic, who's clear, who has a mission and purpose, See, now you're like, oh, okay, Clint, now I get it right. But for real, what this story has shown us so far is that trauma needs to be addressed and worked through. If you don't speak about the feelings that you're having, then you may be allowing them to fester. Trade in that dusty utility belt of unhealthy coping mechanisms. So the fundamental addiction I had was to self-loathing. I hated myself and I needed to regularly prove that I was not okay. So destroying relationships, engaging in risky and really even suicidal, I attempted suicide twice. That kind of behavior was, I don't deserve these things. I can't have this kind of success. The drugs themselves were just a decoration. Alcohol, cocaine, ketamine, whatever's handy. It, that didn't matter. I had this conflicting need to prove something. I don't want anybody to think that there was some magic thing and somebody touched me on the head with a magic wand. Far, farthest from the truth. The invitations are issued in our lives, however they come, but we have to say yes and we have to do the work. So getting sober and having this miraculous introduction to this, I was disowned from my own family. Nobody talked to me. I, I was literally alone and except I had 10 kids, some of which were with me and the rest were somewhere else. Self-reflection is hard to do, especially when depression makes it difficult to, to do literally anything, but it really is an important step and finding the right help and guidance is even more important. So let's listen to what seeking help is like when you're struggling with depression. It looked like finding people to talk to, coming to say to myself, I'm really not okay. I'm not, I need to get some help. And the first therapist, I couldn't even tell them the truth. I lied and tried not to lie and tried to keep control of the situation. And I'm sure I was a disaster as a client. On to the five steps that you can take to change your mindset and change your life. Step number one is to begin to change your outlook. Try to look at life from a different perspective. And finally, learning to be vulnerable, learning to, to explore the truth of my existence. I'll give you an example. Joy and I were having a conversation once, and one of the ways that depression affected me was I would feel like everything was my fault all the time. And so everything was defensive. Everything was an emotional attack. And so she said something to me one day, and I was defensive and I felt attacked. And I said, why are you attacking me? Like how else could, what else could that mean? In that sort of frustrated way. So anyway, I went to sit down and I thought about it. And here's an example of the work you do. So I started thinking about what she said. What else could this mean? And I, then I changed the tonality. Okay, what else could it mean? And just the ability to ask that question in a different way 
was the beginning of something. And then all of a sudden, this thought came to me. One of the things I had was season passes to a resort in Banff, Alberta. So at, at Sunshine, there's a big lift, a ski lift that goes up this mountain and it overlooks a valley on the right. And there's another lift that goes up another mountaintop and overlooks the same valley, but from the left. And all of a sudden, when I was having this conversation with myself, thinking about what she'd said, it occurred to me, wait a minute, there is another mountaintop. And what I meant by that is the valley looks different from this side and from that side. And the question then, well, what else could this mean? said differently in that picture made the whole f framework it was a pivotal moment of this thing that i how i'd interpreted life and all that stuff just crumbled away and if that can happen here what else could this mean that that changed like a lot it felt like the whole framework crumbled it was a visceral framework of my interpretation of my unworthiness and all that stuff just like disappeared but that wasn't an isolated event it was in the context of all the conversations i'd been having with counselors and conversations about this sort of stuff but that exchange and then that picture made me realize there is another mountaintop and we say sometimes you don't see the way world the way it is you see the world the way you are our mindset affects the way that we see, interact with, and experience the world around us. It's really easy to get stuck in the mindset of negativity and to get lost in a hopeless place. Wait, isn't that like a Rihanna song? Anyway, the point is that we may only have one set of glasses, but we can switch out the lenses. When we say that sometimes as an indictment, but it's not. Of course I see the world the way I am. I only have one set of glasses, one set of lenses. And the giant revelation, the first giant revelation is, oh, there is another set of lenses. Can we get stuck in the idea that the ones we have are the only ones? And that we start there is obvious because that's my experiences. So they're the only ones I've got. The realization that there are other lenses is holy crap. There are other lenses. I wonder what those look like. The ability to even begin to ask those questions and understand language, interpretations, feelings, reactions, thoughts on different mountaintops. It's just one example of the work of unraveling decades of isolation and internal, complete isolation and depression. Step number two is to brush off the WTOT fungus and begin to look at yourself in a more positive light. There is intent and purpose to our creation. The discovery of the joy of living out of the prison that we all create for ourselves, where we live with the, what I call the Wittot fungus, W-I-T-O-T, -T, what I think others think. We, we live trapped in that bubble of paying attention to that and defining our worth by all these externalities. And then getting into a place where you realize you're intrinsically valuable, you have something good, you were put here with gifts and talents and you have a purpose. It's like the liberation, the sense of liberation and joy of every single day, I can't even describe. And so I thought, do I get to do? I get to one, be healed. I mean, if there was ever a candidate to be left at the bottom of the canyon, I would have been it as a disaster. I wasn't. So then I thought, ha I have been offered the opportunity. And I said, yes, who else can I help? And so the need, the feeling, the desire is intense. It is infectious. <laughs> and it is real. Step number three is to start your day by determining who you are going to be. And so when I say that's all I do, it is. I, that's what I do. I get up, I have a morning ritual that's long, two and a half hours or three, and it prepares me intentionally. I wrote it, I created it, it's me, to create myself every single day for the person that I wanna be. And so that's where the mission comes from. And it is self-imposed joyfully. So I want you to know that it doesn't matter where you've been, it doesn't matter who did what to you or what you've done to others. There is a way and there is a time 
to change who you've been or what's where you are right now. The future is blank. It is not an extension of the past unless you let it be an extension of the past. No one can write your future unless you let them. So take the pen, take the levers of your life in your own hand. Step number four is to understand that you cannot control everything around you. So direct your energy into creating your own story. Now there's externalities we don't control. This horrific stuff's going on in Europe right now. We don't control that. We don't control the weather. We don't control the economy. We don't control earthquakes. But the energy that we spend railing and complaining and jumping up and down about all that stuff we don't control is wasted creativity. Instead, use every ounce of your love, your creativity, and your will to add good to the world. Like waste none of what you have. I can't fix that anyway. But you make a choice to create out of your life what you want to. That's, that's the message, and it's going to take a process. There's no magic wands. Nobody's going to come and say, ding, you're okay. So, so start where you are and go forward. Step number five is to learn to forgive yourself. Don't get lost in self-loathing. It's easy when you've made a lot of mistakes and done things that you think are bad or hurt other people or whatever it is to live in a place of negativity. I did a video several years ago about forgiveness self-forgiveness and the thing that is striking a chord with people is oh i can never forgive myself you know what that's true you can live in a place where you never forgive yourself okay the consequence of that will be any good that you could do any light that you could shed any lifting that you could do is blocked because you're tied up in this negativity so do what you can to fix things if you've made mistakes, okay. But then let it go so that you can do something good. So you can take the gifts and talents and yearning and love and learning that you've had and add good to the world. Don't deny me and everybody else the light that you could bring by staying perpetually locked up in the past. You want to change your mindset, but you don't know where to start. Everything you try just seems too big. Well, try these two tips. Step number one is to practice the I said it and I did it method. Step number two is to start as small as you need to. The important thing is that you do start. There's a success cadence, then I'll teach it to you right now. And it goes like this. I said it, I did it. I said it, I did it. I said it, I did it. One of the things that we do as depressives and people that are stuck is we lie to ourselves. We don't mean to, but we do it all the time. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, and then we don't. And what we teach us, teach ourselves is that we can't be trusted. So my answer to that's really simple. If you set goals and you can't do them, shrink the damn goals. Get it so that you can do something. I said it, I did it. Because the truth is your body and your heart responds to any level of success. So shrink the goals until you can do, I said it, I did it. I said it, I did it. And even use that cadence. That is the cadence of creation. I said it, I did it. And when you fall and you will, and I have, okay, then get up, Fess up, clean it up, and recommit. Don't give your life to someone or something else. Kellen's experience is super inspiring. And though, although not everyone experiences an intervention quite like this, he does provide good tips to get the ball rolling in the right direction. Co-occurring disorders are very real, and they're certainly more common than you think. But thankfully, with the help of professionals like you, they're also treatable. So go empower and inspire change today. All of my love, and I will see you on the next episode.